We have been wondering for many years, what is the matter with Kansas? And a new book sheds some light on that. We're joined now by Jonathan Metzl, Director of Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University and author of Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, it's great to be here. Very glad to have you here and talk about this subject. So Dying of Whiteness, what is that about? Well, it's it's basically a book about how the politics that claim to make America great again, and particularly white America great again, end up, if you just study the kind of aggregate effects of what's happening on the ground, end up being risk factors that make working class lives, and particularly working class white lives in some instances, harder, sicker, and shorter. I'm somebody who's from the Midwest. I grew up in Kansas City. I live in Tennessee. <clears throat> Excuse me. And basically what I did was just started tracking what happens if you live in a state where you block the Affordable Care Act and don't allow for the expansion of services, or you let a lot of guns in, or you have massive tax cuts that help really wealthy people but end up cutting roads, bridges, and schools to everyday people. And it turns out that those policies themselves are as dangerous to working class people as are man-made risk factors like asbestos or secondhand smoke. And the irony of the book is that the greatest drop in life expectancy in some of those instances were among the white uh, working class voters who were supporting these GOP politics in the first place. So that was a that was a great uh, preview of some of the specific policies. So let's talk about uh, what you found. So you spent years uh, going to these areas of the, the country and talking with people. And what are some of your explanations as to why people continue to support the policies that, that in your words are literally killing them? Well, a good part of it had to do with underlying anxieties, not just about race or racism, but this idea that basically minorities and immigrants were gonna come and take away resources that were due to working class people, very often working class white people. I'll give you one example. I did about two or three years of research in Tennessee around the time that the state was debating whether or not to adopt the Affordable Care Act and the resultant Medicaid expansion. And I did focus groups with people who basically told me that even though they might have benefited, some people I spoke with were incredibly medically ill. And they told me, even though this program might help us, um, we're gonna vote against it in a way or support politicians that do because, and this is a quote, um, we don't want our tax dollars going to what they said were Mexicans and welfare queens. And so part of it was just this idea of racial resentment. The problem with that logic was when they started, I mean, we're all kind of connected in this world, right? And so the minute they started defunding the healthcare system in the state, in effect, um, their health suffered as well. And one of the most shocking findings I found in the book was that blocking the expansion in Tennessee ended up costing the average white person in the state about three weeks of life expectancy. And so there was this trade-off where basically people were telling me, um, we don't want those services going to other people other than, ourself, than ourselves, you know, lazy minorities, stereotypes like that. But it ended up uh, boomeranging and, and, and hurting them as well. So one of the most interesting things is that, so you're, you're giving examples of how racial resentment can lead to these outcomes in particular states, but that you're not saying that it necessarily says anything on the individual level about feelings of personal individual level racism. So how do you differentiate between those two things? That's exactly right. In other words, I make very clear in the book that probably a minority of people I spoke with expressed some kind of overt racism. And most of the people, I have to say, um, were, were not thinking about that. They weren't they weren't racist as far as I could tell. Um, the issue, the big risk factor, it was about the policies, not the people. In other words, if you elected a politician whose policies were based in, for example, taking a lot of resources to try to block immigration in your state, taking away a lot of money that was going to pay for infrastructure and taking that money and using it for tax cuts for wealthy people um, and defunding you know, infrastructure, the schools that your kids attended, factors like that. Um, so part of what I argue in the book is that these policies were based in a kind of underlying anxiety about race in America. Um, and the risk factor wasn't whether or not you yourself had that attitude. It was whether you lived in a state that had those policies that, that ended up affecting your health. And I think probably the most tragic part of my research for me was these were direct disastrous consequences. I also studied Kansas, for example, um, where um, people rallied around this massive tax cut that defunded infrastructure across the state, and it, it collapsed the state. It lost yeah. all of its credit rating and factors like that. But instead of saying, gosh, what's the matter with Kansas? We don't want to replicate that. All of these disastrous policies ended up becoming the framework for policies that are now being furthered at the national level by the Trump administration. And so mm -hmm. in a way, these were the canaries in the coal mine for nationalized policies. 
So uh, I, one final question I, I think is important to ask you. Uh, so how do we fix this? <laughs> well, part of part of what I argue, you know, people ask me when I wrote this book, what are we going to do to change people's Trump voters' minds? And you know, I don't want to go change people's minds. That wasn't my goal. Um, I did come away from this project thinking that actually conservative working class voters should be asking more of their politicians. In other words, part of it is to say change has to come from within. I think it's fair to say I'm a Republican, but also I want better health care. I want better roads. I want better schools. And that promise isn't being delivered. So part of this is about um, the demand, you know, the, 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 what basically what, what conservative voters are asking for from their elected officials. And the other part I learned is just there's a lot of messaging that I think that, that Democratic candidates need to pay attention to if they want to reach people in America's heartland, that these topics that they're wading into, uh, like, um, you know, uh, uh, Medicare for all or uh, gun control, things like that. There are long histories. And so part of what I do in the book is I say there's a long history here. And if you want a message in middle America, you better pay attention to to the debates you're stepping into the middle of. Yeah, and uh, both that messaging and also the long history. This is not a new thing, obviously, as you point out in the book. Uh, more reasons why people need to, to take a look at this so they can understand not just how we got here, but where we might go from here. And That's so Jonathan- exactly right. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. The book is uh, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. Uh, thank you for joining us today on The Damage Report. Anytime. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.